Hi guys, Ricky Pope here, and this week on the Christian Nerds Unite podcast, I talk with Christiana Hale, author of Deeper Heaven, a reader's guide to C.S. Lewis's Ransom Trilogy, sometimes referred to as the Space Trilogy, plus scripture and nerdy news, and we'll get to all of that right after this. Hey guys, this is Ashley Cox from Fangirling Over Jesus. At FOJ, we believe in hope and light in the darkness and that you are not alone. We seek to unite and celebrate the intersection of the gospel and our favorite fandoms, and we get to do this through our social media, our podcast devotional, and our cosplay and fashion. And you can find links to all of that through our website, www.fangirlingoverjesus.com, through our social media, at Fangirling Over Jesus, wherever you get your podcasts, and on Etsy. See you online. Thanks so much for listening to the Christian Nerd Unite podcast every week. Recently, we helped launch the Christian Nerd HQ podcast network. The network releases content every weekday. Christian Nerd Unite on Mondays, Tatooine Sons with David Jesse and his sons, BB Nate and Samuel the Hutt on Tuesdays, Fangirling Over Jesus with Ashley Cox on Wednesdays, The Reverend and the Reprobate with Lucas and Danley on Thursdays, and the Speaking Nerdy podcast every Friday with host Mike Schilling and myself. Go check out ChristianNerdHQ.com to follow all the podcasts and check out the Christian Nerd HQ YouTube channel for even more exclusive content we're creating together. Let's start with some scripture. Let's read Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you've set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds, and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. John 1 speaks of Jesus as the Word, saying that the Word Uh, was with God and the word was God and that nothing was made that was made without him. So Jesus made everything we can see, a huge universe, and we're just a speck compared to that. But he still cares about us so much that he came down to give his life for us. It's amazing. I pray that you'll take a moment this week to step outside and, and view the heavens and the stars and consider everything that God has created. Let's get into some nerdy news. This weekend was the biggest box office weekend since April 2019, the weekend when Avengers Endgame released. The Barbie movie takes first place this weekend with over $155 million domestically and $337 million worldwide the largest Warner Brothers opening since Batman v Superman. Uh, Oppenheimer came in second at $80 million domestically and $174 million worldwide. The Sound of Freedom rounded out the top three, adding another $20 million, bringing it to a new total of $124 million for this small-budget, faith-based film. The SAG-AFTRA Actors Union has gone on strike. Now with actors and writers on strike, most productions have completely shut down. 
along with not being able to shoot scenes, actors are also not allowed to promote work they've already completed. So upcoming film releases will likely be promoted by producers and directors. It has been over 60 years since writers and actors both went on strike at the same time. Some are suggesting that negotiations will not begin again until mid-fall. Uh, NBC and CBS have both already released their fall schedules loaded with competition shows, reruns, and a few selected new seasons that were already complete uh, since they are not going to be able to produce any new content before this agreement happens. 39 truly independent productions have received waivers to continue shooting during the strike. This includes The Chosen, a faith-based series following the life of Jesus. This one received a waiver primarily because it is fully independently funded. All these productions provided paperwork to SAG-AFTRA confirming that they do not have any association to the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers who are in conflict with the writers and the actors guilds. Some productions located in the UK that are covered by the UK equity union can also continue because of some specific and pretty complicated British laws that I'm not going to get into. Uh, House of the Dragon is one such production that will continue. This week, I chatted with Christiana Hale, writer of Deeper Heaven, a reader's guide to C.S. Lewis's Ransom Trilogy. Now, you may be more familiar with this C.S. Lewis series being called the Space Trilogy. Christiana has taken a very deep dive into the series and brings out a lot of ideas that you may not have realized. So let's get right into our interview. Christiana Hale, it is so great to have you on the Christian Nerds Unite podcast today. Thank you for having me on. I'm excited about this. I am too. I have, I have been trying to find a good guest to talk about C.S. Lewis's space trilogy um for quite some time and uh you were one of the names that came up in conversations uh, so i have wanted to talk to you for quite some time tell us just really quick um who who is christiana hale and and uh what what are you kind of known for well definitely being a c.s lewis nerd <laughs> <laughs> that's that's for sure. Um, no, so I, I primarily I'm a I'm a teacher actually. I'm a literature and Latin teacher, which is kind of unusual, <laughs> I suppose. Um, but I I grew up on C.S. Lewis, primarily the Chronicles of Narnia, and just mm. um, grew up knowing him for that and loving loving those books. And I discovered more of his literature, more of his works in college, and mm. just especially the the Ransom trilogy or the Space trilogy, as it's commonly called. Um, I I don't know. It just was one of those series that just spoke to me, right? Um, it caught my attention. I really, I fell in love with it. I also had um, some different college professors that were really, really um, engaging and loved that book. And so that inspired mm. me as well. And it was one of those kind of just snowball effect, how, you know, how I got into where I am now <laughs> and, and talk, talking to you about um, the book that I wrote was kind of just like, well, I, I was really interested in, in those books. I wrote my undergrad thesis on those books. In the course of that research, I realized there's not a whole lot out there at the time, at least. There's definitely more mm. now than there used to be. But this was back in, you know, closing on, closing on 10 years ago now. Um, there wasn't as much out there on the Ransom trilogy, on Space mm. Trilogy. And, and so as I was writing more of this research project, it was kind of an argumentative thesis. I was I just kept running into question after question especially from friends back home or from you know my my parents friends like homeschool parents and things just saying why are you writing on the space trilogy it's such a weird <laughs> it's so weird <laughs> like that was the common common statement like it's so weird I don't get it and they're not wrong. I kept <laughs> they're not wrong they're not wrong and I kept finding myself wanting to be able to point them somewhere and say well go read this book this will help you and there's definitely were some some good books out there at the time, but nothing that really nailed uh, the the audience that I was thinking of in particular. There were some mm. very scholarly works that were really excellent, but mm. I was thinking a homeschool mom isn't going to have time to read this, or it isn't even necessarily 
hitting the things that I wish would be would be hit. And so when it came time, I, I, I continued on to grad school and was working on thinking of a graduate thesis project. I thought, well, why don't I just take all this research I've already done and try to answer those questions that I kept getting, which is why the Ransom Trilogy? Like, why the Space Trilogy? What's the point? Hmm. How can I get give give people handles with which to you know hold on to this and 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 hopefully at least if not fall in love with it at least have an appreciation for what Lewis was trying to do, and hopefully make a little more sense of it. And so that's how that's how my book Deeper Heaven was born. Um, was it was uh, originally meant to just fill a hole that I thought needed to be filled, <laughs> and so and since then there's been more books written about it, which I think is great. I think it's getting. Um, a lot more attention in recent years that mm. is well deserved, I believe, um, because I do believe that it's really just an excellent trilogy in many ways. And um, particularly the third book is very prophetic um, and Lewis shows a lot of wisdom and insight into uh, the nature of humanity in the world and just um, mm. every, there's a lot of things that happen in that book. They're like, oh, wow, this was written. When was this written? <laughs> you know, 50 <laughs> years ago. And, and yeah, that, he, he hits the nail on the head a lot of times with what he has to say. Um, so, so anyway, that's kind of, I guess I kind of rambled on a little bit, but the short story sort of how, uh, how I came to be where I am and where, and how the book came to be as well. Awesome. Well, let's kind of deal with the first, the, the big elephant in the room. Um, I, I, for those of you who are listening on, uh, a podcast app. I put air quotes around it when I said space trilogy and, and you have thrown out the term uh, ransom trilogy mm -hmm. or space trilogy. You've, you've used both terms, mm -hmm. but um, so that is actually a big, uh, a big issue with this particular trilogy. Um, what exactly is it? So why, why do you, think that that has been so con such a confusing part of this whole series. Yeah, so I th I think part of it is honestly the more the more that I research and learn about the trilogy, I think it does kind of defy categorization and mm. that's that does throw people because especially the first book Lewis has uh, so the main character of the trilogy his mm -hmm. name is Ransom, which is where the the term ransom trilogy came from. So Lewis himself doesn't ever really give it a name. So the trilogy doesn't have a name mm. that's been given to it by the author. So um, he refers to it sometimes as his, as his um, cosmic stories. He also says space, he does say space stories at some point. So um, as a side note, I don't think Lewis himself would be too upset that people are calling it the space trilogy. Um, he, okay. he himself wasn't too pedantic about that sort of thing. <laughs> I think he'd find it amusing and ironic if anything, right? He'd kind of chuckle, chuckle about it. So I will often refer to it as the space trilogy because most people know it as that. And it's not, mm wrong necessarily. Uh, but the more we dig into, I think, why one of the purposes for Lewis's writing this trilogy, I think it does make more sense to call it something else. Uh, so I so I can talk more on that in a minute. But um, so when in the first book, though, I think one of the reasons that it's come is commonly called the space trilogy is the first book does lead you to expect more of what we typically think of when we say science fiction, mm -hmm. uh, because Ransom, the main character, um, goes up into what he thinks of as space at the time. Yeah. And he goes up in a spaceship <laughs> um, of, sorts. And, of sorts, right? Lewis does. And he, <laughs> Lewis does have one of the characters kind of sort of try to explain some of the science behind <laughs> the physics of how this spaceship works. And I think Lewis, um, Lewis actually in a letter later on says, realizes that that, that actually wasn't maybe the best thing because it was the science was really beyond him. Like he's not a scientist. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know how it works. Yeah. And he's writing at a time when, you know, we're making, we're taking steps towards actual space travel. And mm -hmm. so he saw the obsolescence of whatever he did coming. <laughs> he's like, <laughs> whatever I do to get Ransom into space, into onto another planet, is going to be totally ridiculous in the next 20 years, 30 years, mm -hmm. 50 years, right? He saw that. And so by the second book, what he does to get Ransom into, into, into another planet is he just has the angels do it. <laughs> 
She's like, yeah. we're just going to have it be, it's more fantasy. It starts to feel more like fantasy and less like yes. science fiction. And so the first book is probably the most sci-fi yeah. of the three. And then so the I, third <laughs> book is pretty much uh, earthbound. Yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah that, that is, I have come from a background of, of loving classic sci-fi novels, especially what people consider hard sci-fi. Mm. So where they talk about, you know, how things work, how things operate, where the authors do do that scientific research and mm -hmm. come up with their best conjecture of how things work or could work. Um, you know, so I love things like, you know, Starship Troopers, the novel from the 50s and uh, you know, some books like that. Um, so when I came into the space trilogy, uh, I kind of envisioned that kind of setting. And uh, I did have exactly those kind of uh, issues mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, reading through his attempted description of how this spaceship, quote unquote, spaceship <laughs> That's more like a coffin than anything else. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I'm like, okay. And then the next book, we just ignore that completely. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the third book it doesn't have anything to do with uh, space, but does kind of revolve around the ideas he's learned through mm -hmm. the last two books. So um, I think that has been a struggle for me to really enjoy this series the way I had mm -hmm. hoped I would, because I do love uh, I, I do love C.S. Lewis. I think if I had come at it, like you were saying, that it's it's a little more on, on the fantasy side mm -hmm. than the sci-fi side, I think maybe I would have enjoyed it more. Uh, and I've read yeah. it two or three times. Uh, so I, I you know I, I know I know the 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 way it works, but I, I think having that understanding would have been mm -hmm. better for me before I started reading it. Now, yeah. now, speaking of understanding, you talk a lot in your book, uh, Deeper Heaven, that uh, C.S. Lewis was has this vision of he's using the ideas of medieval um, cosmology when he's telling this story, which is a different way of thinking about the world. And you 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 also talk about materialism. Uh, mm -hmm. being, uh, you know, kind of the, the juxtaposition there. And for those who are listening, who, when you think of materialism, you think of money, uh, or you think of, you know, owning stuff. That's not exactly, mm -hmm. that's not exactly the kind of materialism we're talking about here. Uh, we're, we're talking about the idea that, that things are rather than things being spiritual, they're being, uh, physical and made uh, of physical matter. So, but but talk to us a little bit about why understanding that idea of of um, medieval cosmology will help us get a better feel for what um, mm -hmm. Lewis is trying to communicate in this series. Yeah, so I think um, the important thing what Lewis does really well, and I think what he understands the medieval cosmology does well is what also is not just fighting against materialism. Lewis was fighting against that idea because that is was the um, the pendulum swing that he saw mm -hmm. um, our culture heading towards, right? Um, mm -hmm. Materialism on one side, which which says that, like you mentioned, all reality only consists of the material. So right. it's not it's less, you know, you can you can call someone a materialist in just the casual sense in that, oh, you, all you care about is just stuff, right? But this yeah. is more of an idea of a world, an entire worldview um, of philosophy of right. What that, is that reality? Everything reality can be explained. Just, yeah, everything in can be explained of the in terms of the physical. And yeah, exactly. uh, that's definitely what he pushes against in this series. Yes. In this and, series. Yes, and for sure. And the other pendulum swing would be more of kind of a Gnosticism, which denies the importance of the physical reality and purely focuses on the spiritual, right? And that mm -hmm. our goal, this is kind of leaning more towards like Platonism, those sorts of ideas where the physical is just a you know, we're kind of bound by it right now, but our our goal, our ultimate aim is to be purely spiritual, right? Uh, beings, mm -hmm. like just shed shed the physicality, right? And 
Lewis is trying to do something in between, right? He's trying to, there's, there's something in the middle. There's not, Mm -hmm. our goal is uh, we are, we're spiritual and physical beings. And that's been, um, that's been the Christian, Christian idea for for, forever, right? That God created us um, to be physical beings, but we're obviously Mm -hmm. created also in his image. So, um, so we are not just body and we're not just soul, we're soul, spirit and body. And so that idea that I think Lewis saw the medievals as really uh, having a firm grasp on they, they the cosmology mm. that the idea the kind of map of the universe that they had in their minds um, was an organization and a structure that leaned into both of those realities so mm-hmm. it is a very physical structure it has a lot of weight and matter to it um, but it's a structure that also is filled with personality and life and spirit and things that we can't always understand or explain Mm. in terms of just the physical. Uh, So I think that that is what Lewis was really fascinated with about the medieval Mm. cosmology and the thing that he really um, takes a hold of and infuses into the trilogy in, in a really amazing way. So we never get the sense that the goal is just to, you know, escape the physical realm. Um, mm. So even though he's fighting against materialism, he doesn't swing into, therefore, you know, since since we're arguing against the idea that everything is matter, we therefore have to say that matter is bad. That's not, or deny matter, right? That he's not, he's not swinging the other direction. Um, he's saying, no, we have to recognize that the reason matter and the physical world matters, <laughs> to, to kind of play on words there, <laughs> The reason it matters, the reason the physical world is important is because of the spiritual reality, because it's not Mm. just matter. Um, There's more to it than that because it's been created and therefore it is important. It has it has importance um, and we can actually care about it. So um, just skipping ahead a little bit to the third book. But in the third book, um, the kind of the enemy of the third book is this organization called the NICE. And one (laughs) of their goals is to just strip everything of organic matter actually and kind of recreate the world into just this 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 metal metallic mechanistic place and they're they're also saying that they deny the spiritual reality and yet mm-hmm. they're taking their orders from these dark spirits and it's just it's very weird right? it's like your your contradiction all over the place um and so that's a really good example of how lewis is pushing against that. He's like, we don't push against that by a rejection of the physical. We push against it by knowing what the physical world is for and knowing what its place is and how to treat it the way that we ought to. Um, And so in the, in the third book, again, you see lots of, lots of animals and Mm -hmm. lots of, lots of nature and, and, and that sort of thing um, coming up, coming up and coming into play. And, yeah, it's just it's just great the way he the way he utilizes it. Um, so that but that he gets a lot of those ideas from the way the medieval the medieval mindset uh, would see the heavens, see see space, and so that kind of leads back to your first question about about space, right? Why mm-hmm. why kind of fight against this being called the space trilogy? Well, Lewis in the end of the first book even says that one of the goals, one of the purposes, would be to get his readers thinking more in terms of the heavens and less in terms of space, right? Mm-hmm. Return to seeing, seeing the fact that the heavens declare the glory of God. It's not, there's more to it than just balls of burning gas, as Eustace yeah. Clarence Scrub says in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, right? Um, there, yeah, maybe that's what they're made of, but that's not all they are, right? There's more, there is more going on than just um, the physical, so hopefully that answered your question a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it does. So now, so there are three books. So let's let's mm-hmm. just kind of briefly go through the three books. So we have Out of the Silent Planet as the first novel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, now the first novel is mostly set on Mars. And so m- m- some people might get the idea that the silent planet is Mars, but that's not actually accurate. Can you tell us a little bit about that yes, and that first uh, novel. So the the key is in the title, right? It's called Out of the Silent Planet, and Ransom leaves Earth to go to Mars. So he's he's actually leaving the silent planet 
to go to Mars. So Earth um, is actually in in Lewis's terms, he names it Thulcandra, Thulcandra and Thulc means silent. Uh, so it's the, it's the silent planet. Why is it this? Why is it the silent planet? Well, um, this is again. He borrows a little bit from medieval cosmology and then takes it and makes it into, expands it in his fictional universe mm. that he's creating. So, in medieval cosmology, the idea is that um, it is a geocentric, geocentric cosmos. Right. Um, so the Earth is at the center, um, with all of the planets then revolving around or uh, spinning around Earth. And as you work your way out, the moon is the first uh, first planet that you get to would get to outside. They consider it a planet. Um, it is called right. the moon, but they still they consider it one of the planets <laughs> in their terminology. Um, so that's the first the first level you might say. And in medieval cosmology, their idea was that everything below the moon was fallen and affected by sin and the fall of man, mm -hmm. and everything past the moon is called the translunar realm so trans just means across lunar across the moon obviously so there's a translunar boundary and everything above that boundary would be pure and unfallen um and not affected mm. by man's sin and so that was the medieval conception and, and lewis kind of takes that idea and then runs with it um, he gets he has some fun with it and says so not only is that true but there's also this kind of unspoken law that nothing can go past that boundary one way or the other. So um, it's mm. it, so none of the angelic uh, beings are actually really allowed to come down to earth or the, at least the at least the big <laughs> A angelic beings, right? Um, there are some some other spirits that can come down, but the the angelic beings associated with each planet can't can't transgress that boundary. Man is not meant to transgress that boundary. And so what happens is he kind of makes this a plot point in the book. So in the first book, mm -hmm. Lewis, um, sorry, the ransom, the character is kidnapped by a couple of men who have already actually gone, gone to Mars. So they've gone up in their spaceship, they have made it to Mars. And they did not understand a word that the natives were saying, they didn't understand the language, they didn't know what was going on. And they somehow got the idea that the natives of the planet Mars wanted a, a sacrifice. They wanted a human sacrifice. And so they came back to Earth to get someone, to kidnap someone, to take back, <laughs> to hand over to the natives, because of course they weren't going to give themselves up. So so that's how Ransom gets kidnapped and taken uh, taken up to Mars and then has he has his um, adventures there, primarily consisting of just getting to know these creatures that are living on the planet. He learns the language um, that they are speaking. It's called old solar. And, and in so doing, you know, they, they've broken that law though. So it's, what's fascinating mm -hmm. and what makes Lewis such a great um, storyteller is that that comes back to play later, right? So it starts, the whole story starts out with these men have broken um, that law. They've broken through that boundary. And once you've broken through, um, you know, a door, a door works both ways, right? <laughs> Once you've mm -hmm. opened a door, um, yes, you can go out, but other things can come in, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so that comes back to, you know, comes into play in uh, both the second and third book. Second book, you know, the reason that the second book happens, Paralandra, is that R Ransom knows the language, old solar now, he mm -hmm. knows how he's the only human, at least at this point, who knows that language, the language of deep heaven. And so he is chosen, he's given this task um, to accomplish on Venus. And in the, that one, again, the angels take him up there. They give him this little like coffin-y sort of, <laughs> sort of a <laughs> ship to, like, it's not really a ship, it's just a container, basically. It's like, yeah. here's a container for you to, to, to lie in while we take you up to Venus. Um, and so that, so that is connected though to the first book. Why was Ransom chosen? Well, it's just because he was kidnapped and no, learned the language while he was on Mars. So he, he gets to be taken up. And then obviously the third book, the culmination of the series, um, I kind of hinted at this earlier, again, a door, a door lets things in as well as letting things out. So yeah. that comes to play. I won't, too many spoilers, right? Not, we don't want too many, too many spoilers, uh, but well, it, that I mean, is important. Let's, let's be honest. The the book is like 70 years old. I, I think we're past That's, the spoiler well, point. There, a lot of people haven't <laughs> read it, though. That is true. That is true. Now, so. now, you said something interesting that I think was a bit of a slip of the tongue. 
but I did want to address and ask this question. Um, so Ransom is a philologist, somebody who mm. studies languages. So just it's convenient that the guy that they kidnapped happens to be the kind of person who could learn a language. Mm. Um, and uh, a slip of the tongue, you, you briefly said, Lewis goes, <laughs> and then you said, I mean, Ransom uh, goes. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like, and, and I don't know that I've read this anywhere, but I've always felt like, Lewis kind of wrote himself into this story as ransom. Is, is, do you think that's it really, is that a thing or is I, that? I think a little bit. So, so what's interesting is that Lewis does actually truly write himself into the story. So in the end of out of the side that is Planet, true. In, yes. he has ransom writing a letter to him. And then in, at the beginning of Paralandra, he actually, he actually writes in first person for a bit as the character Lewis going to going to meet Ransom. And he has a whole conversation with yes. Ransom as a character in the story. So, so there is that. I think um, there is a theory that it, he, Ransom was somewhat based off of J.R.R. Tolkien, um, okay. who was a good friend of, a good friend of Lewis's, who was himself actually a philologist. Um, Lewis was very interested in languages, but he wasn't technically a philologist. His, his he gotcha. was a professor of literature. Um, Tolkien, however, was a philologist. So, and and the the whole thing sort of started, or the seeds of it were sown when the two of them were having a conversation about um, kind of kind of bemoaning and complaining about um, the lack of the kinds of stories they liked. Like, you know, there's just not mm -hmm. enough stories that we like. So um, maybe we should write some more. Like, let's write some more stories. And so there was a sort of challenge that um, Lewis would write a space travel story and Tolkien would write a time travel story. Mm -hmm. And Tolkien actually did start a time travel story, but in typical Tolkien fashion, he didn't, he didn't finish it because he, he was probably being yes. too much of a perfectionist. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but of course, then in typical Lewis fashion, he didn't just write a space travel story. He wrote a trilogy, you know, full length book, length three books you know so he kind of took it took a little farther um so there is some some theory that that ransom is, a, is at least somewhat based off of tolkien himself okay. as sort of a, a nod or an acknowledgement to that um i think very quickly though you do see just his personality takes on I and mean, he takes on its own his own character his own personality and mm. as with any character that an author writes you know it's always um of course, there are elements that are Lewis, right? Because Lewis is the author, oh, yeah. Lewis the writer. I don't know that he was 100% consciously um, writing Ransom as if as it was if it was himself. Um, but there's definitely definitely uh, some similarities and elements that are, especially at the beginning, the first book, um, mm -hmm. more than others, I believe. Um, in the in the second and third book is when he kind of starts his trajectory, his journey has gone on such a different path that he yeah. really becomes comes his own his own sort of entity right <laughs> so um yeah but that was a good good question so yeah I, I definitely think there's some similarities there though for sure now in the second book we we come to Paralandra uh, which is Venus and uh, now in that book we kind of get a bit of an Adam and Eve kind of thing mm -hmm. going on um tell us a little bit about that particular one and, and what what's the, the the main focus there? So yes, it's I do think it is. It's sort of me it's meant to be sort of an uh, Eden, you know, paradise paradise lost sort of retelling. Um, mm -hmm. He's but um, Lewis is very conscious, I think, and Ransom even has has this thought to himself. He's very conscious to not say, well, this is just an exact. Um, blow by blow retelling of the garden of Eden story and the fall of man. And, and if it had, it's just, if it had happened on Venus, right. There's some very, this, this is the story of the potential fall of this world, mm. but this planet Venus, but it's very, it's different because it's happening in a world that Christ has come into. Right. Um, so Christ, we live in a cosmos, a universe where Christ has been, born he was incarnated mm -hmm. he died and he rose again and and that has happened that's happened in the middle of history and that changes things right so so the fact of that 
uh, means that whatever happens on Venus, you know, it's not going to be the exact same story. It can't be the exact same story. Right. Um, and Ransom kind of wonders that to himself. Like, what if I, what if I fail in this, in this task that I have been given? Well, whatever happens is going to be amazing, right? God will redeem <laughs> this world too. It won't look the same. I have no idea what it will look like um, because it's a new story. It's, it's not the same mm -hmm. story, but the parallels are very clear, right? There's there, you have um, the man and the woman who are the only inhabitants of this world. And the Eve character um, is, well, she, it's interesting. She's been separated from her husband. So they're not actually together for the majority of the book. And so Ransom, in a sense, is sort of this Adam-like character because um, his, his, it's his job to try to stand between her and the, the serpent character, which is um, kind of a, a, it's a man from the first book. His name's Weston, but he's been possessed by the devil. And so mm -hmm. he's, he's kind of the serpent character trying to tempt Eve, the Eve character. And so Ransom is sort of this, this odd in-between, <laughs> go-between, right? He's supposed, he's trying to, protect her from that but he also um is trying to you know trying to protect her in a way like keep keep her from doing it try to convince her that this is not mm. what you should do um so it's, so it's a very interesting book in that there's a lot of conversation throughout like a lot of the book for for the majority is a lot of different conversations that are had between ransom and the eve character um between ransom mm -hmm. and the, the devil character between all three of them. And there's lots of, lots of talking conversations. Um, and it really is fascinating. Lewis was clearly very, um, very inspired by Milton's paradise lost as well, though there's a lot of imagery that he, he draws from there. Um, and the setting itself on, on Venus is just a beautiful, beautiful setting. He does a really, his pulls out all the stops on the description on this book, which makes sense. It's the planet mm. named after the goddess of love and beauty. And, and so he really just draws that out in the way he describes the physical nature of the planet as well. Uh, so that's kind of the, the arc of the, of the book, or at least the, the hook of the book. Um, it's probably personally my favorite one, um, even mm. though um, I think, probably more for personal reasons. I just found it really striking when I read it. There were a lot mm. of, a lot of things that were, um, that I still just go back to whenever I, whenever I think about it. So, um, it, if I'm, whenever I'm pressed, I have to say that Paralander is my favorite, uh, though I, I love all of them. So it's very hard to pick, to pick a favorite. <laughs> now, uh, now kind of the, the, the bad guy for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. uh, we have Weston who appears in the first two books. Um, and then we we talk about you know ransom. He's kind of the hero, mm -hmm. the 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 person we follow. Um, and ransom has kind of an interesting name, but we do kind of have this ransom as kind of a Christ figure, and Ran and Weston as kind of you know the Satan figure, mm -hmm. you know, trying to to battle it out. Um, but we even have even a more direct uh, uh, Christian um, analogy where we have, you know, that uh, where Ransom actually hits Weston in the head with a rock, mm -hmm. crushing his head, but um, Weston injures uh, Ransom's heel. So we have that, yes. <laughs> that, yeah. that almost direct, which... Which is kind of a very Lewis kind of thing. Yes. Uh, you know, Tolkien is famous for saying he doesn't like things that are you know that blatantly obvious. Uh, but uh, even though he has some things that are pretty blatantly <laughs> obvious, uh, but uh, you know, Lewis was was not ashamed of mm -hmm. of doing things that was like, oh yeah, this is absolutely an allusion <laughs> to a biblical passage. I'm not even going to try to to yep, hide yep. that fact. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's probably honestly one of my favorite scenes actually is when when Ransom picks up the rock and he just and I, I love it. He just says, in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, here goes. <laughs> and that's my favorite. That's my favorite line. I it's, I don't know. Every time it makes me laugh. It makes me chuckle. Uh, but yes, I mean, and it is amazing, though. I mean, we say it's obvious, but it is actually missed by a lot of people, a lot of readers. Mm. So, I mean, and part of that is perhaps depending on your level of biblical literacy, right? Um, true, being familiar true. with that story. I mean, for us, as soon as you hear 
oh, he crushes his head and his heel is, is injured. Like, there it is, right? The, the head and heel, like as soon as you hear that. Um, yeah. But it, it, it can it can actually be be uh, missed sometimes. But that it is really important, especially I think leading into the third book, because Ransom very clearly has a sort of a Christ figure role to play in mm-hmm. the third book, even though he's not, at first it doesn't seem like he's as present in the third book. So the, um, I know kind of getting into the the last book of the trilogy here, but um, the third book actually kind of refocuses the main characters. There's, there's a married couple, Mark. Yeah. I was going to say, let's go ahead and go into that. Mm So um, uh, that hideous strength is the name Mm -hmm. of the third book. And uh, it is completely different in my brain Mm -hmm. than either of the other two. Uh, Weston is no longer involved. So we've lost the guy that we've thought of as the bad guy for the last Mm -hmm. two books. We have a whole new group of people and uh, Ransom kind of takes a different role. And yes. uh, we're, he's, I mean, he is a major character and he's an, super important, but he's not exactly who we follow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's gone. He's kind of stepped into more of a, a background <laughs> secondary, secondary in terms of where we as the readers are tracking, right? So yes. um, he's definitely very important, but we are following along with um, different characters now. Um, I will say that the, so from the very first book, um, the two men that kidnap Ransom are uh, Weston and Divine. Um, Weston, as we, as you mentioned, he, he dies at the end of Paralandra. So, well, right. I argue that he dies much sooner than that when the devil like fully takes over him. Um, mm. So really Ransom kills the devil, <laughs> but that's, a, that's yeah. another, another, another thing. Um, but, but divine from the first book actually is Lord Feverstone in the third oh. book. So he does, he does come back. So there is sort of this thread of, even though Weston is gone, Weston's ideas, his philosophies, his vision for reality are still being, are still well and alive um, in the mm-hmm. NICE through, through Lord Feverstone and, and through, um, the other people that are clearly still proponents of Weston's uh, ideas, ideologies, right? Um, so it's still the same enemy in a way. It just looks different. It's in a different form. Um, it's definitely more of an organization, less one man. Um, yeah. And so it, it does feel and look very, very and an, and an organization that you instantly know is evil because <laughs> it's named NICE. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like, I have a feeling this is not accurate. <laughs> uh, that that is one of those that that is one of those things where I, I read Lewis and I'm like, really, really, we're gonna yep. go there. Okay, we're gonna go yep, there. Yep. All right, you know, all right, what's funny let's go. Is there actually is you could you could Google it. There is an organization in England that's the an acronym is Nice. It's known as the NICE. Um, so. <laughs> I believe it would began after Lewis wrote this book, but it's not, it still is there. It's existent today. So it's something about, um, yeah, I can't remember what it stands for exactly, but, um, but there is, and you you think you guys need to read more books. If you think that's a good name (laughs) for your, it's it's been ruined forever. Oh my goodness. So it was great getting to know Christiana. We talked a long time, so I decided to split this one up into two episodes. Make sure you listen next week to part two and check out the links in the show notes below to follow Christiana. Well, that's all I have for you today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, you know, just click all those links, uh, whatever the links are down there, so you can keep up with the new content as we release it. You'll find all of our social links and links to our YouTube channel and to our online store at ChristianNerdsUnite.com. If you enjoy the show and want to help even more, consider becoming a supporter on Patreon. We have some exciting Patreon option levels, and every level has great benefits that make a huge difference in the ministry we're able to do. Supporters will also get to hear exclusive stories of believers we're serving around the world through our ministry partners. To check it out or partner with us, go to patreon.com slash Christian Nerd Unite or ChristianNerdUnite.com and click support in the menu. And don't forget to check out ChristianNerdHQ.com for more great podcasts. Before you go, I do want to leave you with this blessing from Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, 
that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. We'll see you next week. Blessings. Hey.